this transform. Well, the point is this is because this is uh, the transformation parameter is a Gassman value parameter, it doesn't form a regular group. Right? There is no analog, there is no analog of a finite transformation. Right? Because if you take normally the way you go from infinitesimal to finite transformation, then you exponentiate. Right? But here, if you try to exponentiate, right, the zeta square is zero. Right? So you don't really have a group in that sense. Right? I mean, the algebra is the one that is a very bad one. Yeah, so it's a new symmetry in the sense that it's not the same as gauge symmetry. But of course, this is related to gauge symmetry because we saw that the transformation laws of the usual matter fields okay, is the same as gauge transformation but in a specific uh, gauge parameter. Okay. So certainly, BRX symmetry is derived from gauge symmetry. If the theory was not gauge invariant, there will be no BRX symmetry. Okay. But as a symmetry, it's a new kind of transformation. Right? Because the uh, ghost, for example, didn't have any transformation on the gauge symmetry. Right? Because they appeared after gauge fixing. Okay. So in this sense, it's new symmetry. Right? That is, the, the gauge symmetry is not a symmetry of this uh, theory. So if something is uh, with trying to reinforce gauge symmetry after gauge fixing, sorry, sorry. See, we are not trying to reinforce. I mean, you have no choice in uh, how you try to, uh, I mean, force a symmetry, you adjust the coupling, couplings in such a way that the symmetry is there. Here, of course, we are not adjusting the coupling, right? We have started with the gauge invariant Lagrangian, then we just did gauge fixing, and once you fix the gauge fixing term, everything else is fixed, right? It's not that you have you have anything to adjust by which you can ensure that this symmetry is present. Right? But after you have gotten the action, right, which is unique given the original gauge invariant action and the gauge fixing term, then you find that this action has a symmetry, right, which is a BRS symmetry, and because it has this symmetry, we can use it. To prove renormalizability, that the uh, uh, that you don't generate counter terms which are not already included in the action. Right? So it's not something that we enforce in the sense that there is no choice, right? You enforce the symmetry by uh, uh, adjusting the couplings, but here you have no choice to adjust the couplings, right? You have started with a gauge invariant action and then you have gauge fixed. So we did something Find the, the of the that is true. So given an action, whether the action has a symmetry or not, that's a well-defined question. Right? It's up to you to derive what the transformation laws are so that it leaves the action invariant. If you can find any transformation that leaves the action invariant, that the symmetry is there. Right? So it's not that we had a choice. Right? Of course, you can make an arbitrary transformation, which is not going to be a symmetry of anything. Right? But that's true for all symmetries. Okay? That's not what one says by uh, means by saying the enforcing symmetry. So enforcing symmetry normally means that you have to adjust your couplings okay? so that you throw out terms which are not uh, invariant under the symmetry. Okay? In uh, five, uh, five to the four theory, for example, enforcing symmetry will mean that you shouldn't include the five tube coupling. Okay? But here you are not doing any such thing. Right? Here you have no choice of what the action is. Once you have started the gauge invariant action and gauge fixed, the action is given to us. Right? We can now we have to see if this action has certain symmetry. Right? If it has a symmetry, we can use it to prove renormalizability. And it so happens that in this case the action does have a symmetry, which is a BRS symmetry. Right? Not every action acquires a symmetry, however much you try. Right? You can try to revise transformation laws of various fields. In general, you will not find that you, you, you can find a transformation that leaves the action invariant. So it's not that this is something that you are enforcing. This is something that you are finding. Okay, this particular action has, has this BRS system. Is this? Yeah. And will this always always be possible? The way you you uh, uh, the, the way you constructed uh, derived the symmetry uh, was like it, it it appears that it will always be the case. Yes, because. I did it for yeah, I didn't assume anything about the gauge group, yeah, right? right? I didn't about, uh, assume anything about the action except that the action, the original gauge fixing, gauge invariant action was gauge invariant. Right. So it is always possible. Okay. This procedure is completely well defined. Mm -hmm. right? Given any gauge theory and any gauge fixing term, you just follow this and it will be a symmetry of the action.
Yeah. So general procedure that you can follow for any case. <coughs> is it possible to choose the gauge parameter to be xi times b and find gauge parameter? It's not c. Not in general. You can try. Sometimes there is something called anti BRIC symmetry, okay. which is something similar, okay. but that that may not always exist. Okay, BRIC symmetry yeah, always exists for a gauge invariant. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Somehow, uh, I'm a little bit puzzled about this. Mm -hmm. Uh, gauge symmetries are essentially an indication that we are somehow working with redundant degrees of freedom. Once we gauge fix, that means we have gotten rid of uh, the redundancies. Exactly. After that, uh, somehow we are, uh, uh, the, the implication of gauge symmetry it seems is that we'll always be able to find some BRST symmetry, right? Exactly. So somehow, uh, can I, will I be wrong to say that uh, the signature of gauge symmetry is always present, no matter, I mean, well, no, it's not the point. Yeah, of course, it's the signature of gauge symmetry because yes. the original axiom of not gauge invariant, the BRST invariance will be lost, right? Yes. Because one of the ingredients in proving BRST symmetry mm -hmm. was that the original axiom was gauge invariant. Right. Okay. But other than that, mm -hmm. okay, this symmetry is not a gauge symmetry, right? Yes, this, this is, doesn't, is a global symmetry. Yeah, this is a global symmetry. Yes. This doesn't uh, I mean, cause any problem with the, uh, finding the propagator. Precisely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So in that sense, it's a new symmetry, mm -hmm. but it's always present when you start with the gauge symmetry. Mm -hmm. And gauge fix. Yes. Right? If you had gauge fix and not added the ghost action, mm -hmm. then this symmetry will not be present. Yes, that's true. Right? Mm -hmm. But the particular pro 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 procedure that you have followed, mm -hmm. right, that you gauge, add the gauge fixing term and then you also add the ghost term, mm -hmm. always ensures that this symmetry will be there. Yeah. Right? So it's a consequence of gauge symmetry, but it's different from gauge symmetry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's different. But somehow, uh, yeah, like if I if I want to reinterpret once again gauge uh, symmetry, it's like some of the field configurations were essentially same. When I was uh, like, uh, suppose yeah. I have this field space, then but that you have of course fixed. Yeah, yeah, the that means you have double count, multiple counting that you have fixed. Exactly. Now yeah. the point is that even after gauge fixing, mm -hmm. because there is once again some symmetry, mm -hmm. so some of the configurations uh, most likely are once again same, which I would. But these are related by global symmetry. Right, right. In fact, uh, not, not just global symmetry, the transformation parameter is also anti property. Right. right. So it's yeah. not a usual symmetry. Yeah. Okay, but it's a symmetry, uh, this symmetry is good enough to prove renormalizability. Namely, that uh, once the symmetry is there, only those terms will be generated which are invariant under this symmetry. Yeah. So it's not that you have, re I mean, uh, recovered the original gauge symmetry. Mm -hmm. Right? It's just a consequence of the original gauge symmetry, but in the gauge fixed action, it's a new symmetry. The gauge fixed action doesn't have the original gauge symmetry. Yeah. And also, one more thing. Now, the point is that uh, whenever I have some global continuous symmetry, I should be able to find some conserved charge uh, for that. Here, also, we, we should be able to do that. Because, That's right. But uh, for the gauge symmetries, there is no con notion of uh, conserved charges, right? Well, the global part of the gauge symmetry, you can sometimes define conserved charges. Yeah. Right? That's so total electric charge, for example. Exactly. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, but the global part, mm -hmm. right? So essentially, uh, the statement goes like, if I have a global symmetry, then I should be able to find, by the Euler prescription, continuous global symmetry, I should be able to find uh, conserved charge. That's right. Here we started with uh, uh, gauge symmetry, but what I'm able to see is that I'll always be able to find some conserved charge for the BRST. Uh, yeah, but it's a formulaic charge, right? Okay. It's not a regular charge, Okay. Uh, or like electric charge. Right. Because it's a Grassmann, the gauge transformation parameter is Grassmann parameter, right? Mm -hmm. So the conserved charge itself will be Grassmann value. Right. And that, that will not have any. That will. Okay. That will involve the host fields also. Right. The host fields yeah. also transform under this BRST symmetry. Right. 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 So this conserved charge that you are getting mm -hmm. is not made of the original fields. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. In fact, one can show that all the physical. Operators, mm -hmm. right? okay, it's, it's actually not hard to see mm -hmm. that the, all the original gauge invariant operators are BRST invariant mm -hmm. because original gauge invariant operators are made of only matter fields, right? Matter fields and gauge fields, okay. they are gauge invariant. Right? So, when you make a BRST transformation, it's the same as gauge transformation on those fields, right? With some specific gauge transformation parameters, so they are all BRST invariant. And you can show in general that the only observable quantities in this gauge fixed theory are those which are BRST invariant. Right? 
that now if we want to suppose somebody has given you this gauge fixed theory, right? I ask you to tell us which are the observable, observables. Right. Not every quantity is observable in this theory, right? Because you have lost now, and furthermore, you don't have the original gauge symmetry, right? So how do you identify that? Suppose you have somebody gave you, gave you some quantity made of the matter field, ghost fields, various other things, right? And ask you, is this an observable quantity or not, or yes. a physical quantity or not, yes. right? And the answer is that if it's BLST invariant, then it's physical. Yes. Okay, so that's what I want us to test in this gauge fixed uh, version of the theory. The realist invariance replaces the role of gauge invariance, mm -hmm. but it is a generally different symmetry right, that you have to keep in mind. So, is it realist invariance then it is gauge invariance? Well, if it's made of ghosts, mm -hmm. if, if, if it's made only of the uh, original uh, matter fields, yes. right, then, then and the gauge then then, then, then realist invariance. Yeah, uh, yeah, then realist invariance. You can show uh, implies gauge invariance. But in general, suppose you have an operator made of ghosts, matter, and everything else, right? Yeah. We didn't even know which one is ghost, which one is matter, right? Somebody has given you this action and given you the symmetry. Yeah. Okay, once somebody gives you the action, you can look for the symmetry, right? Yeah. And suppose you have found the symmetry. And now you can ask that how do we determine which are physical quantities? Right? And the answer is that if a quantity is BRST invariant, okay. that is physical. Okay, that you take any operator. See how it transforms under BRSC transformation. If the transformation is zero, then you call that a physical operand. But in this language, you can forget about gauge invariance and you can show that effectively you get the same physics. You may get a few extra operators, but a few extra operators that will get this way. Will actually give zero expect for correlation function. Okay. So in that sense, you don't, you are not adding new operators. Okay. But nevertheless, if you just formulate it this way, then you can forget about the original gauge invariant. Just say that all operators which are BRST invariant are physical. Okay. They should include the original gauge invariant operators and then some more. Okay. The more operators that uh, the extra operators that you get, okay. which are BRST invariant, you can show that their correlation functions vanish. So in that sense, you are not really getting anything more than what the original theory gave. But formulated this way, you can just forget about all reference to original gauge invariance. Okay. Formulate everything in terms of the BRST. So introduction of ghost was just a trick to uh, deal with this determinant which was arising. Uh, That's right, yes. So suppose somebody uh, finds some other way to deal with that determinant. Yes. Then how we, that will, I mean, this thing will Well, show this is basically, if somebody finds some another of you determine, that basically corresponds to integrating out the ghost fields, right? But integrating out fields, you don't do the symmetry, right? Is there a symmetric transform, the laws will become much more complicated if you integrate out the ghost fields. Okay, if you, I mean, ultimately, if you, formulate it in a way without ghosts, right? you'll still see that there is some kind of symmetry, which is a, which is a residue of the original gauge symmetry, right? there is a consequence of the original gauge symmetry, which will, you can use to prove your normalization. In other words, once you gauge ticks, you have broken the, the Feynman rules are not gauge invariant. Right? Nevertheless, when you actually do quantum calculation, okay? it's not that all possible gauge invariant terms, gauge non invariant terms are generated. Right? There is still some control. Right? Once you have, you, if you use the language of ghost, then you see it in the form of BRST symmetry. If you use some other language, you will see it in some other form. So if we are given the free content as gauge field, matter field, and ghosts, yes, and uh, we want to write down an action. So if one generically writes down an action which doesn't have this BRST symmetry, those quantum field theories will be non integrated probably, right? Exactly. So typically, you can write a renormalizable quantum field theory by adding everything, yes. right, which will satisfy the criteria of renormalizability because you include only dimension four or less operators, and you include everything of dimension four. Okay. But those will typically be uh, non unitary. Okay. I mean, they will violate spin statistics theorem, for example, right? Because there are these ghost fields are just one value; they are anti-commuting fields, but they carry integer spins. So they'll violate spin statistics theorem, they'll violate, violate unitary, it will not be a sensible theory, even though it may be renormalized.
system. Okay, so we had a discussion for 20 minutes, <laughs> assuming that the action is BRST invariant. <laughs> so how many of you have checked that the action is BRST invariant? We still have to check that the two terms cancel, right? Any of you have checked? So with the side. With the side? Yes. With the side, we checked, I checked. With the? Side that you are given. So instead of the AJ, we use the side. Yes, yes, that's it, yeah. So with the side, you have actually calculated the commutator. Yes. And it gives you some at B square F, uh, B, D, A, okay. R, A, T, A. Okay. So the commutator gives uh, you uh, yeah. again. Yeah, it gets transformed to the left. Yeah. So then, if we say that it doesn't matter whether it's AJ or psi, then we can say the same over that. Okay. So, so that's why. Okay, and then everything cancels, including I the psi? No, I. Okay, so that's something. Uh, for the psi, also you have to check, right? That the mm, sign cancels. Anybody else try to do this? Calculate the anti commutator? Commutator. Well, commutator, yes. I mean, the one in, in terms of DC it is anti-symmetric, right? The, or not DC, the CC product was anti-symmetric, right? So you can anti-symmetrize this whole thing and then identify as a computer. Yeah. Right? That was the idea. Yeah. Okay, so let me then quickly go through it anyway. So let's recall what the leftover terms were. We had minus integral b4x, b4y, 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 This was one term, right? This came from the variation of the gauge uh, fixing term. Sorry, this came from the variation of the the ghost, okay? But the, the matter part of the ghost, ghost that, okay? Variation of this. And then the other term, which is in minus integral d4x, d4y. So this one came by postulating that the ghost, the C, field transforms this way. Okay? This was what came from delta of C. Okay? So the goal now is to try to analyze this. Okay? And the strategy for analyzing this is that because this has a commutator, okay? because this is anti-symmetric under C goes to B and Z goes to Y, okay? so you can replace this by a commutator with Cz replaced by by and by replaced by Cz with a minus sign. This result, okay, whatever this commutator is, will be, be independent of what H is. Right? It will be some new gauge transformation that you have to apply your H. Okay. So we'll determine this by applying, by not calculating not this, but replacing it by some simpler thing. Okay. 
okay, which has a simpler transformation, okay, like a psi which transforms in some representation. So you calculate then delta delta phi c z of delta psi theta delta theta to the phi. So I should have put the x here. So this is the argument for the x. And then the solution will be phi and evaluate phi is that. And then minus b and c x t y and x t. So okay, this is what you want to calculate. So it's replace h here of h here by psi. So let's see what this is. So this will be delta delta theta v of y. What is psi theta? Okay, this is a transform of psi by theta. So this is psi of x minus i g r a of t b times i g let's say theta d. This is what you're trying to calculate. This is what this curly bracket, whatever you're creating is that curly bracket. Okay. So this can be easily calculated. This is delta delta theta b of y times i g theta d of x. Okay. So this gives you delta b d delta y minus x. Okay. And since d is summed over, basically d is replaced by b. So this is minus i g theta b of Okay. Now you have to transform it by phi, right? The psi, there is psi sitting here. Nothing else, of course, is a key. These are just known functions. So you have to transform it by phi. So this gives you, from here you will get minus i g r a t b and now 1 minus i g phi e r a t b phi of x. And this whole thing we have to calculate delta delta phi c of z and then set phi equal to 0. So when you take delta delta phi c of z, it basically acts on this. this these are all x's. So you can get a delta 4 of x minus z and delta c e. Okay. So the effect of that is to basically replace this e by c. So this gives you minus d squared r a d b r a d c delta 4 x minus z.
Sorry, sorry. This is actually y minus x. Sorry, y minus x minus x one is right here. Yeah. So the other one we will do it now. So the commutator. Right? So we are trying to calculate this minus b goes to c, y goes to z, right? So you see y goes to z, nothing happens here. This this part is just the same. Okay. So b goes to c is the only effect. So this will be R A T C R A T. So this difference will be minus b square R A T B with R A. Here, yeah, okay. it doesn't matter. Yeah. We we'll eventually to make this y minus z because once you have a delta four of x minus z, right? Yeah. You can replace x by y. Right? That's the whenever there is a delta function, any function multiplying it, we can replace the argument of the delta function by zero in that function, right? So delta four of x minus z, delta four of x minus y is the same as delta four of x minus z, delta four z minus y. Plus this square. So there's a minus i g and minus i g, right? Mm -hmm. Two minus i g is so minus g square. The two minus i, right? Is it okay? Maybe there's an overall minus sign. Yeah, overall. Yeah, overall minus, overall minus sign is here. That that will have to put. Yeah. Okay, not that one. Not that one. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to replace this by I F E C let's call it D R A T D. I G T. No I. Because DBTC is FBCD, IFBCD, TD, right? And this is true for all representations. Okay, that's uh, the group property means that R of U1, R of U2 is R of U1, U2. The algebra property is that the commutator is follow the same rule as the generators themselves. Okay, for the representation. I'm going to write this as the I take one factor of G outside F B C D I don't know let's, let's do one more thing minus I G R A T B Okay. 
I just re-arrange it to GF, GCD outside and put a minus IG inside. This one, I can write as delta delta theta D, Y. Is this clear? Because psi theta, when you make a transformation, okay, it's psi minus ig ratd theta d delta times psi. Okay. So if you calculate this, okay, after taking into account delta function, etc., you will get exactly this. Then okay, the same procedure that we are following, then okay, if you follow, this quantity will be just this. Okay. So I'm not going to rewrite this, I'll erase this again. Okay. So remember this. Your top thing will be given by delta 4 of x minus z and then d f d c d. Well, half will come when we try to do this. At least this, this is an identity. This is the how you expect the subtractor of minus b goes to c. Okay? And let me do one thing. Okay. That at this stage I'm going to change this x minus z to y minus z. Because as I said, because if there is a x minus y, right? I can always set x equal to y here. Okay? So instead of writing the delta x minus z, I'll write delta y minus z. Okay, make life a little simpler, but it doesn't really matter. At the end, of course, x, y, z all are all, all going to be the same. Okay, because of the delta function. So now, what is the trick that once you have derived this, I can now replace this psi by a j. Okay, because this is an algebraic identity. This does this, even though we have derived it for some specific psi, okay, which transforms linearly, okay, which just goes to r of t a times psi. This property is a property of the group or the algebra. Okay. And this property will hold acting on any uh, field component. Okay. It doesn't have to be, you see that this property, the knowledge about RA has gone completely, right? RA keeps information about how psi transforms. Okay. But once you have written it this way, there is no knowledge of RA. Okay. And this basically shows that it's a group property and it should hold for any combination of fields. Okay, so that's what I'm going to use now. So this term, using this, I'll write this. I'll write the first term. And minus integral d4x, d4y, d4z, d4 for y, d4 z, 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 d4 z,
And now a factor of half, because you see here, we have to subtract from here a term where C and B have been exchanged, Z and Y have been exchanged, right? And you are allowed to do that because this is anti-symmetric under CB exchange and ZY exchange, right? But when you subtract, you are basically adding the same term, right? That's what it means. So you have a half, okay? It's half of this minus the corresponding exchange, okay? So when you apply this, then you get a half B, A, B, C, B, delta A, K. And then of course we'll write this again. Eta C C. Okay, so let's do the y integral. Y and half or the z integral. So we get to d four x d four y. Yes. Uh, when uh, this exercise we can do it any HA theta. Mm -hmm. That's right, yes. Uh, for our uh, thing HA is del mu in. Yes. And their mu transforms with linearly theta. Yes. Derivative will be there. So delta will not be occur there simply. Yeah. Ch I agree. So you'll have, yeah, for, uh, if you want to do it directly on HA, right? There'll be a little more, few more uh, terms. Because there's a del mu theta term, right? So this replacement. I mean that. Uh, yeah, but the point is, if you want to do it for HA, right, you can go ahead and do it for HA. Right? You will see that all the extra terms cancel. But what I am saying is that because this commutator is a property of the group transformation, okay, it doesn't matter what it acts on. Okay. If you are not convinced by this, you can take HA, del mu, mu, and repeat this analysis. Right? And you will find exactly the same result. Uh, no, uh, what I am saying is some kind of local property that uh, um, varying the uh, thetas at a particular point will not uh, uh, that appear in this delta function uh, because that we can uh, all there are infinitely many parameters at each x that's right we can independently vary that's right yes for so for h a yes. if you actually want to use h a right because h a has a real mu theta right so h a behaves as if it's an adjoint representation but there's an extra piece because the gauge field transformation has a del mu theta, theta, right? So in the H transformation, there will be also a minus box theta, right? That's the kind, not the final transformation which is present here. So you can, you have to use this. If you want to directly do it on H, you have to keep track of the minus box theta and repeat the same analysis, okay? You will get box of delta function and so on. At the end, you will find that all of those terms cancel and this result is still true with psi replaced by H. So what I'm trying to say here is that because this is a property of the group, it doesn't matter. I mean, you knew from beforehand that it should work for HA once you have derived it for psi. Okay. Because it's a property of the algebra or the group and not on what it acts on. Okay. But if you want to do it explicitly on HA, then you can do it and you will find exactly the same answer. Okay. The work will be a little more important because of this extra inhomogeneous term, right? the box theta right now. Is 
Okay, so now the claim is that these two are equal or uh, opposite, right? So here the sign is plus, there are, the sign is minus, but of course you have to check all the indices, right? So B carries index A, H carries index A, so that part is okay. So F, G, C, D, so theta D, right? So here, so what we have to do? We have to exchange, pardon? Is the same, yeah. So B, C, D and D, B, C are the same, right? So I can put it here. So let's see. So the first index of F con contracts with this index, right? Here, if we move the D here, the first index contracts with theta D. <coughs> then we have B C, here you have C D in opposite order. Right? And here again you have D E, here you have E D in opposite order. Okay? So these two terms are identical, except for the overall sign, because here it's plus, there it's minus. Okay, you can convince yourself these are the same terms. Right? I can now change the indices, but it will just make things more confusing, right? You just see what is contracted with what. Okay. The first index of F is contracted with the theta. Here, first index of F, once you move D here, is contracted with this one. The second and third index are contracted with two Cs, but the second one is with the last, this is the second index now. This one goes with the last one. And the last one here goes with the last but one, right? It's opposite. Same is true here. The second one contracts with the last one. Last one here contracts with the last but one. Okay, so this one is the sum is zero. So this exactly cancels the second term. Yeah, but the point is these indices, I have not been careful about upper and lower because these are, these are just raised by delta i. So it doesn't matter whether you write it above or below. Because for this AB indices, right, as I have said, because the you're raising and lowering of parties is just identity, delta AB, right? It doesn't matter whether I have written it on top or bottom. Okay, if you want to be careful, of course you have to write things appropriately so that the contraction is it's an upper index with lower index. But here the metric is delta m, so I'm not uh, keeping track of this. Any other question? <coughs> okay, so what I'll do now is that I'll give you some results for the renormalization of gauge theories and then I'll leave it as an exercise for you to verify all of this. Okay? Because essentially the point is that the procedure now is exactly the same as in uh, phi four theory. We have the gauge fixed action. We use the Feynman rules to calculate various amplitudes, okay, which are possibly divergent. Then cancel those divergences by adding counter terms. Okay, we add that, add that with dates to uh, cancel the divergence. There is always the ambiguity of having a finite constant, okay, which of course uh, we have to keep in mind. So we'll give some explicit results in gauge theory.
So the action that I will be considering is it will consider gauge theory. Coupled to form one. Okay, I could also add scalars, but I'll give the results for only uh, when you have only formulas coupled to it. Okay, but similar results exist also for scalars. We'll use the gauge fixing function. Yes, gauge fixing as minus one over two alpha integral d four x. Okay, this is what we discussed yesterday. This of course fixes the ghost action, so I will not write it again. So okay, so with this I can tell you what the So the renormalization in constants, how do you introduce the renormalization in constants? So we will take, for example, that a mu a is z tilde a to the half. So this is a similar kind of convention that we had used earlier. A mu a r. So r starts from the renormalized fields. Okay, for phi, for phi to the fourth theory, r taken phi as z tilde phi to the half times phi r. Right? This is the analog of that. Okay. There will be similar thing for psi. So psi will be the tilde psi to the half psi r. Okay, now when I say psi, it of course is a multi component field. Right? Every component gets normalized like this. The host will also be normalized. So CA will be z tilde ghost. Now notice that I have not introduced separate constant for B and C. Right? I have used the same Z tilde. The reason for this is as we saw that in the action, C and B always come together. Okay? It's always in the product C times B. <coughs> so there is always a possible scaling in which you scale C by something and scale B by of something opposite. So what really can be determined is the product of these two. Right? Because all counter terms will involve the product C times B. Okay? So if you multiply C by some constant, multiply B by some opposite constant, uh, inverse constant, it makes no difference to the action. So what you can determine is only the product of this constant times this constant. Okay? So using that freedom, I have just chosen these two constants to be equal. Okay, it's certainly not necessary. What you can determine is that's the product of it. Is this point clear? This is the same reason why we couldn't determine individually the conform of the uh, uh, scaling dimensions of B and C. Okay? We can only determine the scaling dimension of B and C together. Okay, now the coupling constant. So G will be ZG times GR. Alpha will be normalized in general. It will be Z alpha times alpha. R. And the mass of the formula will be ZM times M. Okay, so this M is the so M refers to the mass of the formula. Formula psi of mass M. Okay, so this is M psi bar psi term. Yes, alpha is the gauge fixing alpha. Okay, in general that has to be normalized also. This 
Is this okay? <coughs> now, I leave it as an exercise to check. Okay, so I have to modify this a little bit because of this check that in 4 minus epsilon dimension, This, this procedure is the same as that in case of phi four theory. Right? We saw in the phi four theory that lambda, the dimension of lambda was epsilon. Right? Here, the similar analysis will tell you the dimension of d is epsilon by two. Right? So, because of this, we have to we'll modify this a little bit by writing this as mu to the epsilon by two. Because then g r will be dimensionless and gives a good parameter in which you do part of it. So I'll now leave it an exercise. I'll give the result, but the actual calculation will be exercise, and this will be actually part of your homework problem. So you might have start doing it already. Okay, before I actually distribute the problems here. Okay, calculating all of these zeds. Okay, it's not very hard. I one loop, right? So just one integral you have to do for each of them. So exercise. Okay, you can obviously see if there is a mistake. Right, then you. Find it. So I start from z tilde i. To define what these are, tr and c t. So this R A R is by definition T R Okay, I know my I Normalize T A and T B so that trace T A T B in the fundamental representation is half delta L B. With that, you take any representation R A, okay, calculate this trace, it will be some constant times delta L B. That constant is what I call T R. Okay, it depends on what representation the partner is in. And if A C D F Yeah, G for the group. Okay, so it's called, called I mean, if, it, if you are dealing with ACUN, normally you call it C of ACUN. Okay, so I have written that, so I have written C. And it's R representative representation. Pardon? No. This is for any group, right? For S U N, C G will have a specific value, right? But this is the result for true for any group. Okay. And you can also see how this will come. Okay. I mean, it's not you know, very hard to see. So, for example, what graph will determine this X is that? This is a normalization of the A, right? A. Yeah. So, what graph will determine this? Yes, A correlation. Because A tilde will appear in the A normalization, right? When you normalize A. 
Okay. So basically, you have to find, look at graphs like this. Goes and or something like this. Right? You can see what the part is. You have to you have to draw all possible graphs. Right? And then you are looking for the divergent pieces, right? And the divergent pieces you have to cancel again by adjusting this Z A. Okay? Is is Z A good enough? Is there anything else that you have to adjust? What other Z alpha? See, Z alpha will also affect it, right? Because Z alpha multiplies the quadratic part. So, Z alpha and Z A are the two things that will have to be adjusted to cancel these. Right? And you can see, so what will this be proportional to? This coupling is proportional to what? G square, and then in terms of group factor, this formula, right? Trace of 2A. Yeah. So, sorry, yeah. there is an array of TF here and array of TB here, right? So, trace of array of TA, array of TB, right? That's what this TR is going to come from. Right? So, you can already see that this TR term, right? This term must be coming from here. All the others involve the FABC. Okay? So, these, these three together will be given this. In general, they are independent. You have to calculate it. Right? I have not told you what their alpha is. I will give tell. No, no. Because there are two different kinds of terms in general. Right? You see, unlike in phi 4 theory, okay, where the quadratic term okay, had a term proportional to p square and constant p. Right? In this case, the constant p shouldn't be there. Because we shouldn't get generate a mass for the gauge p. Right? See, if, if this two point function okay, had a term, you have to do a Taylor series expansion. Right? around P equal to 0 and start cancelling the terms. If the Taylor series expansion had a constant piece, okay, there is nothing that you can do to cancel this. Okay? Because if you look at the original gauge, gauge invariant action, right, all two-point functions involve derivatives of A. Right? F mu nu, F mu nu, that involves derivatives of A. The del mu mu whole square, that also involves derivatives. Right? So you better make sure that the constant piece cancels. It's not there. Then the last diagram will not contribute, right? Pardon? Then the last diagram should be. Well, it may contribute. It may can cancel the constant piece from somewhere else. Right? But, okay. Some of the, in the sum it will not contribute. In the sum it will not contribute. But you have to make sure that it doesn't contribute in the sum, right? So you throw out this last diagram, you may find a constant piece from the rest of the diagrams. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this diagram shouldn't be, the, I mean, eventually this will cancel. Right? There shouldn't be any constant piece. Okay. But even in the, part that involves momentum dependent pieces, right? Because it's a vector no, yeah. particle, there are different tensor structures, right? The momentum dependent piece, for example, there can be one term corresponding to P square times eta nu, right? Or P mu, P mu, right? Both of these have to be cancelled separately, right? That's why I need two renormation constants, right? We need ZG as well as Z alpha, okay? To be able to cancel these all possible divergences. So, alpha is already chosen? Alpha you have chosen, right? But you have to do renormalization. That you divide it into two parts. And you adjust one part to cancel the divergence. Okay. Fortunately, because of gauge invariance, I mean, there is a relation that I am going to mention. So I have to give you the results for all the rates, right? And we are supposed to verify it. So Z alpha, one can show this name as Z tilde. Okay, as Z tilde is given here. 
Okay. Now let's see what this means. So if you take this term 1 over 2 alpha del mu mu a del mu mu a. Okay. In terms of renormalized quantity, which will be minus 1 over 2 alpha r del mu mu a r del mu mu a r times del tilde a over del alpha. Okay, because alpha is del alpha times alpha r and a mu is del tilde to the half times a mu r. Okay, so you get this. Is okay. Now the normal renormalization procedure will tell us that you should write this as a sum of two terms minus one over two alpha r del mu del mu r del mu del mu r minus del tilde a over del alpha minus. This is how we will divide up this quantity. And now the idea is that we will have to adjust this to cancel off appropriate divergences that can be cancelled by this. Is this clear? That's the way Riemannson works, right? That you always divide into the original act terms, okay? the renormalized action, and the counter term action. Okay? So this will be the part of the renormalized action, this will be the part of the counter term action. And this has to be used to cancel the divergence. So when I say that Z, Z alpha is the same as A tilde, okay, that basically means that there is no divergence which needs to be cancelled by this. Okay, so when you actually calculate this diagram, you will find that you don't need a counter term for this. Yes. Yeah. So. What I'm saying is that you have to basically you divide the full action into the original action plus counter term action. And then for every counter term action, you have to adjust the coefficients to cancel the divergences, right? Now, what you'll find is that you don't need this counter term. See, just like in the case of uh, phi 4 theory, one loop, right? We found that you don't need the counter term for the wave function normalization, right? We just needed the m square phi square, that part we needed the counter term for, but the wave function we didn't need. Right? So that's why z tilde phi turned out to be 1. Okay? Similarly, you will find that you don't need this to cancel any divergence because when you actually calculate this diagram, the divergences that appear here, well, they are dependent on momentum, but they are cancelled by the other kind of term, which is the f mu See, there is also a counter term for. Z tilde a minus 1 times f mu f mu, right? So that will cancel the divergences. You don't need that one. See, these are these have different roles to play, right? These are these have, have different tensor structure. F mu nu f mu nu has one kind of momentum dependence at a quadratic level. This one has a different kind of momentum dependence, right? So what we will find is that the f mu nu f mu nu counter term you need, right? That's how we get a non-zero z tilde, right? But this counter term you don't need. Okay, that's why Z alpha is the same as Z tilde. Like. Here, this is true for only one loop. Or true for one loop, yes. So all is, all of these are one loop elements. So the reason Z phi is one loop is there is no momentum dependence in the divergence. Yes. In, in so here, of course, there is momentum okay. dependence, okay. right? But the momentum dependence is in a form which is of the form f mu nu f mu nu, right? I mean, f mu nu f mu nu when you translate to momentum space, there is some specific structure. The divergences also come with that specific structure. Is this okay? Yeah. 
So here is the charge, of course you can contract the number of real mileage fields or the full fields, it doesn't matter, right? The way you have contracted a VRST charge, that it's in terms of original fields. But once you have these, you can always re-express in terms of real mileage fields. Right? And the coupling and the zinc. Okay, so now I have to give the rest of the terms. Z till the ghost is given by okay, some factors may be not correct, but we can figure it out when you actually do the calculation. C minus one. Cr is some new quantity, right? So I have to explain what Cr is. So Cr is given by defined as follows. So sum over A, if you calculate this, R A T A, R A T A. So see, this is different from taking the trace of A T. Okay? We take this as a matrix, square it, okay? and then sum over all the generators. This you can show is proportional to identity matrix, and the constant of proportionality is our E C R, is identity. For any group. It, it shouldn't matter because the point is yeah. all the answers that you will get will be in terms of these quantities. Yes. Right? So mm -hmm. when you express the answer, right, you, you can just use these identities and express everything in terms of C G and P R and so on. Right? You can see why where this comes from, right? Z tilde psi, right? Why C R? Right? This is something you didn't appear before. This will come because if you take this kind of graph, right? This will be a term proportional to R A of T A, right? Now this index A is the same as this index A because it's a gauge field propagator, right? Okay. So this will be R A of T A and this will be R A of T A, right? No trace, right? Because the formal loop doesn't close. It will be product of R A T A times R A of T A and you have to sum over all generators because this, you have to sum over all A, right? That's where this kind of quantity is going to come. Okay, so the, when you express the results in terms of these constants, it doesn't matter which gauge loop you are using, right? You don't have to assume it's right? Okay, two more. We have machine constants have to give. Zm. Most important one is the G. So the point is that ZG, as I have told you, that the adjusting the same ZG 
you can cancel many uh, divergences. Okay, so you have to check that that is true. Okay. This ZG okay, will appear in many graphs, right? Three gluon, uh, three gauge field vortex has G, ZG, right? So when you look at the divergences in the three gauge field coupling, you have to cancel it using ZG. The coupling of a horn yon to this, this will also have ZG, right? The ghost coupling will also have ZG. Okay, so you have to check that all of those give the same ZG. Then yeah, otherwise you run into an inconsistency. Okay, and, but you know that it has to be the case because of the BRS symmetry. Okay, because you have added everything consistent with the BRS symmetry. Okay, if you change, for example, the coupling of the host to the uh, gauge fields, we can make it a different coupling, it will not be BRS invariant. The action will lose BRS invariance. Okay, and then, of course, you have to generate everything. Pardon? Yes, you have to calculate only the divergence part. Because to calculate this, and as I have already emphasized that, you see this one over epsilon, okay, that you can always have high at constant to each of these. Okay. I have given the result in what is called minimal subtraction. Okay, so minimal subtraction scheme tells us that you just adjust the ZGs to cancel out the divergent pieces, don't add any finite constant. Okay, you use dimensional regularization and you just subtract the whole piece, right? the piece which goes to the 1 over epsilon or the 1 over epsilon square. Don't add to ZG or to any of the Zs anything that has a finite constant. Okay. So this is a particular renormalization scheme. Okay. And as I we discussed, that if you use a different renormalization scheme, that just corresponds to redefinition of coupling constant. Okay, or redefinition of fields, which doesn't change the final result of any physical quantity. Okay. Now, as I had said, that this is the most important quantity because this is what tells us that the theory of strong interactions is described by gauge theory. So we'll discuss it later. Okay. Is the sign of this term. Okay, which determines how the theory behaves at high energy. Okay, and that in turn is related to whether use the uh, theory of strong interactions is described by gauge theories or not. Now, before I end this renormalization okay, discussion, let me just say one more thing, okay, which is that we have said that using BRST invariance, okay, we can we are guaranteed that these counter terms will all be related to each other. Okay, that you don't really need anything more than what you have already added to that. So we don't need to add count. We don't need counter terms which for which there is already not a coupling present in the action because we have added everything consistent with the BRST symmetry. Now this statement is true if the BRST symmetry is a symmetry of the regularized theory. Where by regularized theory, I mean the theory in D dimensions in general. Because if the theory in D dimensions, which is what you have been using to regularize, is not BRST invariant, then the fact that the original theory was BRST invariant, it doesn't guarantee that the counter terms will uh, satisfy what follows from BRS state variance. Right? Because after all, we are calculating the counter terms, we are working in uh, D dimensions, right? Four minus epsilon dimension. Okay. So it's only BRS symmetry is also a symmetry of a theory in four minus epsilon dimension that you can hope to get consistent results. But then why, why would it depend on the dimension? I mean, that's like you're generating four minus Okay. 
So the point is that in this case, the way we have discussed it, it will not depend on the dimension. Okay? But that is not always the case. Okay? And the prime example is the standard model. Okay? <laughs> the standard model, as we discussed, uses a gamma pipe. It's a chiral boson. Chiral formulas, right? And gamma 5 cannot be generalized to a 4 minus epsilon dimension, right? This is what we have discussed, right? So the gauge symmetries of the standard model do not survive in 4 minus epsilon dimension. Is that clear? Because to, de I mean to describe, I mean the way we have described the gauge transformations, right? We divide it into left part and the right part. And wrote down the transformation of the left part and right part separately. Okay. But we could have also written it in terms of the full uh, formula. Okay, instead of thinking of psi L and psi R, when you wrote delta psi L is equal to something and delta psi R is equal to something. And they are different forms because psi L was a doublet, psi R was a singlet, right? If you remember the standard model field content, right? Under the SU2 gauge field, these, the left moving forward ones transform the doublets, right moving ones transform the singlets. Instead of writing in terms of psi L and psi R, I could have written psi, okay? but delta psi, the way we will do it is that I will write this as half 1 plus gamma 5 delta psi L plus half 1 minus gamma 5 delta psi R. Then use the results for psi L and psi R. Okay? Delta psi L was something times psi L, delta psi L was something times psi R. And then re express back, instead of psi L, I'll use half 1 plus gamma 5 psi. And psi R, I'll use half 1 minus gamma 5 psi. So I could have written the whole gauge transformation in terms of psi only. But the transformation laws will involve gamma phi. Is this clear? Right? So what I'm saying is that I wrote in terms of psi L and psi R. Okay? But I could have written in terms of psi. But I have to use gamma phi if I want to write in terms of psi. So in either way, in defining the gauge matrix of the standard model, we have to use gamma phi. Right? Either we use the gamma phi to first define what psi L and psi R are. And then write the transformation laws in terms of psi L and psi R. Or you don't introduce psi L and psi R, you want to psi all this, but write the transformation laws in terms of gamma phi. And there the problem comes that in 4 minus epsilon dimension, there is no rational generation of gamma phi. So you cannot write these gauge symmetries in 4 minus epsilon dimension. Is this yeah? And if you can't write the gauge symmetry, you cannot also write the BRS symmetry, right? Because on the matter fields and gauge fields, the BRS transformation involves gauge transformation. So this means that if you just naively somehow generalize gamma phi, okay, some ad hoc prescription for gamma phi in 4 minus epsilon dimension, and calculate your counter terms, okay, calculate your uh, amplitudes. In general, the amplitude should not respect gate invariance or BRS invariance. Because BRS symmetry has been broken in the middle. Right? You don't really have a BRS symmetry of the theory in 4 minus epsilon dimension. Is this here? Okay. Now, this is bad news, but this is not the end of the world. Okay? Because sometimes you may be able to get away with it. So the trick is that, okay, you find that your intermediate state, BRS symmetry is lost. So as a result, when you calculate amplitudes, you don't respect the identities that the BRS invariance implies. But then you ask the question that, is it possible to restore BRS invariance by adding to the action explicitly non-BRS invariant terms? So these are not arbitrary non-BRST invariant terms because if you allow arbitrary non-BRST invariant terms, then of course you, can, you have to add everything, right? But these are non-BRST invariant terms that you add precisely to cancel the lack of BRST invariance that you have encountered because of the regularization. 
sir. In that case, uh, the lepton, uh, leptonic part and the baryonic part that will not cancel also like the uh, in general d dimension. Yeah. So in general d dimension, right? What will happen is if you do dimensional regularization, leptonic part and baryonic part may not cancel. You have to add explicit terms in the action, which will cancel this, which will cancel the lack of BRS invariant terms. BRS invariant. But it's not always possible to do this. And in particular, if you find, if you don't adjust the leptons and baryons appropriately, if for example you add the quarks and not the leptons, you will find that it's not possible to write any, uh, add any local term in the action, which will, which will cancel the uh, lack of BRS invariants. So this is the important point that regularization may break your gauge symmetry. Okay? It's good if it doesn't. Okay, because then you don't have to worry about all these problems at all. Okay, if you can maintain gauge symmetry all the way, then there is no way you can not have gauge symmetry or BRSC symmetry at the end. But if your regularization has broken BRSC symmetry, even then, there is a hope that the final theory can be made BRSC invariant by adding explicit non BRSC invariant terms in the action. But those terms have to be local terms, right? That they have to have finite number of red values, right? The terms that you add, should be again dimension less than or equal to four terms. Okay, otherwise they'll generate uncontrolled divergence. But if you can add dimension four or less terms, okay, which are not manifestly BRS invariant, but whose role is to precisely compensate for the lack of BRS invariance that you have introduced due to regularization, then your theory is still renormalizable and has BRS invariance. Yeah, these terms will still remain, these terms have to be there to cancel the lack of BRS invariance. Right? So when you regularize, of course, at finite epsilon, everything is lost anyway. Right? But even in the epsilon goes to zero limit. Right? There are various one over epsilon terms which can uh, combine with the order, order epsilon terms to give a finite result, okay? which are not BRS invariant. But as long as those finite results, which are not BRSC invariant, can be cancelled by explicit non BRSC invariant terms, local terms in the action, you still have a BRSC invariant theory. Right? You can still construct a BRSC invariant theory. Well, it's not fine tuning in the sense that what you add to the action is not arbitrary. It's completely fixed by what you have generated by these loop corrections. Right? The, the regularization has essentially introduced non BRSC invariants, and that's what we are trying to cancel out. So as I said, this can be done for the standard model, right? and that's why standard model is consistent. But if we didn't have the leptons, if we just added the quarks and not the leptons, or vice versa, okay? then this theory has a genuine anomaly, and by adding local terms, you cannot destroy the invariance. Okay, so this is something you have to keep in mind, that you may not always have a regularization, right, which respects the gauge. <coughs> in that case, you have to use this trick, that Add explicit non -in uh, uh, invariant counter terms to cancel off the lack of invariance that you have introduced because of the regularization. Sir, uh, there may be such kind of symmetry in the classical action, but means after means after calculation in quantum means when you do the loop calculation, some symmetry may be broken. So, uh, is that such kind of symmetry always can be uh, incorporated in the quantum action by just uh, adding the? No, that's what I said. Even in the standard model, right? That if you didn't have the quarks, but only the leptons, or vice versa, yeah. then the classical action still has that symmetry. Yeah. Right? But the quantum theory will not have that symmetry. That right? the theory will be anomalous. So it's not that if the classical symmetry is broken by quantum uh, by regularization, right, you are guaranteed that you can restore it. Right? In some cases you can restore it. If the theory is not anomalous, you can restore it by adding these local counter terms, lo local terms, which are not BRS invariant. But if the theory is anomalous, then you can never uh, restore BRS invariance by adding local terms. Right? So this is the difference between theories with anomalies and theories without anomalies. Right? Theories without um, theories which allow to regu allow regularization which respects the symmetry, gauge symmetry, they are never anomalous. Right? Because there there is no scope of having any non-invariant terms in the at any stage. Right? But then there are theories which 
do not allow regularization okay, which maintains invariance but those could also be non anomalous if you can remove them by adding local count And then they are showing which are anomalous for which this nothing can be done. Uh, important thing is local count that terms means adding non local all can do. Exactly. Then you can just subtract out the whole thing, right? <laughs> 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 you can declare all the S matrix <laughs> elements to be zero. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so that you can always do. So yes, so by adding local counter terms, right, you have to be able to uh, uh, remove the lack of symmetry. Pardon? These extra terms depend on the particular regularization that you are using. Right? They are not, not invariant on a PRS symmetry. Right? As I said, they are local terms. And they have to be adjusted to cancel off the lack of PRS invariance. They, they arise simply because the regularization has broken it, broken the symmetry. The point is that in, in the case of standard model, right, we know that if we had just changed the field content, then there's no regularization which can do it, because it's purely generally anomalous. Okay. So if you want to find a regularization which will yeah. make standard model manifestly yeah. BRS invariant, right, you have to make sure the regularization is such that it can be only used when the field content is this specific one. That regularization cannot be used for any other field content. Right? Because for a generic field content, it will become anomalous. Right? And in general, it's hard to find. Right? So the standard model, the standard practices are you just use dimension regularization. And then whatever yeah. lack of invariance you have, you remove by adding explicit counter terms, which are not uh, yeah. BRSC invariant. Okay, so I think we'll continue next week. Next week there will be some rescheduling of the classes. <coughs> I'll send out a mail sometime later.